All right. So if you've been coming to our church for a little while, you'll notice that there might be quite a few differences between our church and, and some of the other independent fundamental Baptist churches that are out there in general. Maybe you haven't visited very many other independent fundamental Baptist churches, but let me tell you, there are definitely some distinct differences in the way that we hold our service and some of the things that we do that, that have become commonplace in the independent fundamental Baptist movement that's out there today. And there's very good reason for that. I think there's a lot of things and a lot of traditions that have been started and have been made that, that are not scriptural and are not biblical. And as I mentioned, I believe I mentioned in the sermon this morning, you know, everything that we do, I did mention it when we we're talking about the soul winning and the methods that we use, we try to derive all of that from God's Word, from the Bible. We want to look and see what does God have for us to do exactly. And when we do things, even in our church service, okay, congregational singing, we don't just do congregational singing because we like music and we like to sing, so why not add that to the church service? We do that because the Bible tells us over and over to sing praises unto the Lord. And in the midst of the congregation that I sing praises unto the Lord. And, and we see evidence of, of all of these various types of ways of worshiping God, of, of how we ought to behave ourselves in the house of God and, and the establishment. Why do we have a pastor? Why you, all the little things when you just think about how is this church run? Why do we do things the way that we do? Well, the reason is because we're trying our best to follow what the, what the scripture says. And what I'm going to be preaching about this evening is something, a practice that you'll find if you go out and visit other Baptist churches, and, and you know, I don't even know how many other denominations do this, but I know for sure it's in Baptist churches because I've gone out and seen this in almost every other independent fundamental Baptist church I've ever been to, and that's the altar call. This, this idea of having someone up, and if you're not familiar with it, I'll just tell you what it is. At the end of the service, typically what happens is you'll have a preacher, you have the pastor, whoever, kind of stand up, and they'll have everyone you know, close their eyes and bow their heads and they'll start playing the music and they'll, they'll kind of try to get you worked up into this emotional state to where they'll, they'll ask people, you know, if you've, you know, whatever was preached tonight, you know, is this talking to your heart or you got a problem? If you got something you need to bring to God, come down to the altar right now and they'll say, you know, people will get up out of their seats and they'll come down and, and literally come all the way up to the front. You know, this is typically right kind of where the pulpit is. Usually there's a raised platform. You know, we're talking in, in bigger churches. Obviously, we're a real small church. We're, we're meeting in a, in a smaller place. But normally, when you go into these churches, that's, that's the way it's set up. And sometimes we'll have little Kleenex boxes and stuff set up at the front because people get really emotional and start crying and they need, you know, tissues or whatever, okay? This is typical when you go to a Baptist church, and they'll, and they'll usually, depending on how many people are coming, they'll have the music playing for five minutes or whatever, and you're just kind of standing there and just waiting and waiting and waiting, and you'll have the person saying, come on up, and come on up, you know, I'm going to give you, okay, I want the pianist played one more time through, I want, you know, if you have a problem, you need to come up, and you need to settle something with God, come on up here, and, and it's kind of a big production, okay, and I see a lot of smiles, and I mean, people nodding their heads, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's not found anywhere in Scripture. Okay, this is not something that you see. Happening. And I'm going to kind of go through point by point why we don't do this. Now, it's easy enough to just kind of fall into the mold and say, well, this is what people do, so we're just going to do the same thing. But we don't want to just fall into these traps of, well, it's always been done this way, so let's just do it this way. Because you know what? It hasn't always been done that way. Right. Now, it may be done that way for years, even decades, or, or even hundreds of years, but it doesn't mean that that's right. There are instances of the Bible where God has told them to do certain things, like when they keep the Passover, that they're supposed to stay in booths. That was like not adhered to for, for centuries. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, this is what we're supposed to do, and they do it. And that's the right thing to do. And we always need to be going back to Scripture and saying, what is the right thing to do? It doesn't necessarily matter the way things have been done if it's not found in, in the Bible. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean if you don't find it in here that it's just the worst thing in the world. But I'm going to go through examples of why, first of all, we shouldn't be doing... Like, I don't think that they should be doing the altar call. There's many reasons why 
I don't believe that. And I'm going to start off, this is why we started reading Exodus chapter 20, of even just calling the area up front an altar to begin with. Okay, that is just, it's just false. It's just not true. You know, some front area that where everyone's attention is focused on is not an altar. Okay, and I know they'll say, oh, but it's just figurative. Oh, we're just saying this because it's a place where, you know, you offer up a sacrifice and, and you're coming up here to, to sacrifice something unto God and, you know, whatever. But that's just confusion. We don't, we don't need to be calling a certain area an altar to come up to the altar. This is not an altar. This is a podium right here. And I use this piece of wood to, to help me because I could put my Bible down. I could put some notes here and I got a bottle of water. You know, it's, it's a helpful tool. But ultimately what we need in, in church is the word of God. And thankfully we have chairs to make it a little bit more comfortable, be able to sit down and then, you know, in this, you know, a, a climate controlled room. But we don't even need that. We need the word of God and we need God's word to be preached. Okay. But look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 22 because the God outlines if you're going to have an altar, this is the way it needs to be. So if we're going to say we have an altar in church, well, why wouldn't we follow God's specifications on that? Look at verse number 22. Moses says, And the Lord said unto Moses, and he was commanded to have an altar. They were, they were to have an altar in the Old Testament. Okay, and this is one of those things that's, that's changed. But look at what he says in verse 22. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen, in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build of it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. So first he's saying, look, I want you to build an altar of earth. This is what I'm commanding you to do. So, so you're supposed to just take, just build up a mound that's, that's an altar in order to, the purpose of it is to put their burnt sacrifices on. It's, it's something, again, another tool. It's an altar that's built up in order to perform the sacrifices. And it's becoming, it should become very obvious to you right now why we don't have altars. Because we don't have to offer any burnt sacrifices in the New Testament. Jesus Christ was a Passover lamb slain once from the foundation of the world. Those things were a figure for the time then present to teach them truths, to teach them of the sacrifices of the one that was to come. And as they followed through and did these rituals and performed the sacrifices that they were commanded to, per to perform, they were teaching them. They were instructing them on the shed blood that was going to come from Christ once for all, Amen. as the song that we sang earlier before service started. Now, this is why we don't have altars. This is why we don't need them, because the whole purpose of the altar was to do the sacrifice. But he says, he gives a little caveat, says, I want you to make it out of earth. But if you make it out of stone... If you decide to set up rocks, if you decide to do it, to make, create an altar of that, of that um, f fashion, I have another rule for you. He says, don't build it out of hewn stone. And hewn stone is something that they worked on. So if you were to go out and just find a big rock, find a boulder, find a stone, and then you start carving it, right? And you start putting tools to it and working on it in order to shape it and form it. And you get those real nice you know, square bricks or whatever. God said, don't do that. He says, don't make it out of hewn stone. Don't cut it out. You're supposed to just use, hey, this is what God created. God created the earth and he wanted the, you to use earth to, to put his sacrifices on. He said, if you want to build out of stone, don't go out there and start carving it up and shaping and everything. Just use what you could find as far as the rocks go and just find ones that are going to lay together and are naturally, you know, flat or however you want to build it. He says, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. God's altar is one with materials that he has created and haven't been adulterated at all by man's tools, by man's work. The sacrifice that's being put on that altar and the altar itself 
are all things that are from God. And he says, when, as soon as you start messing with it and tampering with it and changing it and shaping it, you've screwed it up. Now, the place that Baptist churches today call an altar, like I said, they're usually on a platform. They're usually nice and, and, and planked out and, and, and set up real nice. Is that made out of earth? Is it even made out of stone? Usually it's not even made out of stone. Now, if it is, they're, al they're already disobeying you know, the commandment here of, of putting a tool to it. But either way, it's not a legitimate altar. And look, I understand. They're not trying to make an Old Testament type of an altar. I get it. But why are you calling it an altar? Because this is the altar that, that the Bible talks about. And do a word study for altar. This is what you're going to find an altar is. Let's not start calling other things altars that aren't altars. Because it's not. But look at verse 26. Also, he says, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. He's saying specifically, look, and when you build the altar, don't make it steps so you have to go up to it. Because then your nakedness might be discovered by people below you, right? And all of these Baptist churches, they have it up, raised up on a platform. And they say, this is the altar. And they have steps leading up to it. It's like, how much more unscriptural can you possibly get? It's not supposed to be on steps. It's not supposed to be lifted up. The altar was used for, and this is all throughout the Bible. We saw that in Exodus 20. And going all the way back to Genesis chapter 8, Noah built an altar unto God. It says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. That's what it's for. You're not going to find another definition for it all throughout Scripture. That is what the altar is for. Now think about this, though, as far as being up on a raised platform. Not only does the Bible say that the nakedness be, not be discovered thereon, but when people, and this is because this is what happens in other churches, they go up to this altar and they get down on their knees and 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 will literally kind of put their head down and get down on their knees before what they call this altar. Do you know there's almost always a man either standing up or sitting down still up on that platform when all these people come forward and they get down on their knees and put their face down to the ground on this raised platform? Does that sound like it's right to you? Because you know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like worshiping. Now, a lot of people don't understand the definition of worship. Most people think of worship and they think of people putting their hands up in the air and singing songs unto God. Okay, that's, the, that's like the common thought, I think, that, that a lot of Christians would think today that the word worship means. That's not what it means. Turn, if you would, to Joshua chapter 5. I'm going to show you many biblical examples of, of worship literally meaning People going, getting down on their knees and, 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 and kind of doing reverence before someone in that sense is called worship. Now, you do your own word study with this when you get home. You can look up all the time worship is found in the Bible and it's many times. You'll find it like probably hundreds of times. Most of the time it uses the word without really giving a whole lot of extra information on what does it exactly mean. If you were to define worship, what does it mean? And it's used in context of wor you know, worshiping God, worshiping the Lord, or worshiping a false God. Okay? But in Joshua chapter 5, I'm going to read a few of these for you. Verse number 14, the Bible reads, And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? So he fell on his face. He got down on the ground. I'll just read these for you. You don't have to turn to all of them. 2 Kings 5.18 says, In this thing the Lord pardoned thy servant. And this is when Naaman the Syrian had gotten cleansed. If you remember the story of Naaman the Syrian, he was a, he, he was a leper. And he was told to go wash in the river and that he would be cleansed. So... He didn't do it at first, then he does it, he gets cleansed, he comes back, it says, and, he, and he's talking to um, Elijah, right? Yeah. In 2 Kings chapter 5, he's talking to Elijah and he says, In this thing the Lord pardoned thy servant, that when my master, or it might have been Elisha, you know, I think, no, it was Elisha, not Elijah. But um, in this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, 
and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. So he's saying, when I go there to worship, he's saying, because he, he got saved, he believed on, you know, he finally realized, wow, the Lord is God. After he got cleansed, he realized this and he's saying, you know what though? I already know what's going to happen. He says, I'm going to go in there with my boss. I'm going to go in there with the king. He's going to, he's going to want to worship in the, in the house of a false god. And he knows the routine. When he goes in there with his master, he says, this is what happens. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to have to bow down myself also. He said, I don't want to do it, but I, you know, he's kind of like, I'm in this situation. What am I supposed to do? And he's just asking in advance for forgiveness. He's like, please pardon when I go in to the house to worship and I bow down myself. So again, and, and the whole point is there the connection between worshiping and bowing down. In Psalm 95, verse 6, the Bible reads, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. In Revelation 19, verse number 10, the Bible reads, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. These are just a few examples. I could go on and on with many more examples that will show you the same exact thing, the connection between worshiping and getting down on your hands, on your knees, and just bowing down. Bowing down, putting yourself down, putting your face to the ground is worshiping. And we are not to worship man. We're only supposed to worship the Lord. We see that in the Ten Commandments. We read that in Exodus chapter 20. Not to have any other gods before them. We're not supposed to make idols, bow down ourselves unto them, and not to worship them. When someone is bowing down, now look, you say, well, I'm not worshiping a man when I go up to the altar and I bow down. You say, I'm worshiping God. That man shouldn't be up there because you know what that's going to put off the impression of? Is that yeah. he's worshiping the man. Yo, know, that's at least, at the very least, that's the way it looks. That's the way it appears. And I'm not going to do, you know, we're, we're told to, to um, abstain from even the appearance of evil. Amen. We're supposed to try to do it. We're supposed to do everything upright and not even look like we're sinning. You say, yeah, but in my heart I'm worshiping God. Yeah, but there's a man standing right there and you're getting down on your knees in front of him. That's not right. That's not the way it should be. And I would challenge anyone who doesn't think, who, that thinks that altar calls are godly or scriptural, something we should be doing. Show me one example of an altar call being made in the Bible. Show me one example ever, anywhere in the whole book of anyone doing an altar call. It's not there. I mean, first of all, you're not going to find the Old Testament because the altars they went to, they were offering burnt sacrifices on. They weren't doing an altar call saying, hey, come on down and bring your animal. I mean, that, that would be the only thing they'd be doing is bring, you know, bring your animal here to sacrifice. We're not doing that. And in the New Testament, there's no mention of it at all. The other thing they use the altar calls for, and I touched on this a little bit this morning too, on how it's backwards for churches these days to turn church into a place where people come to get saved as opposed to the church being sent out to get people saved and then to bring the believers in. It's a complete backwards philosophy. And what they've done, though, in, in trying to bring in the unsaved, they use the altar call as the time to try to get somebody saved. Now, what happens here is that they make it, as I mentioned before, they call people up from the audience to come down and say, well, if anyone's here not saved today, if you, you, know, you don't know Christ as your Savior, and they try to have everyone's head bowed and eyes closed to try to make it a little bit more comfortable for someone to come forward. But I'll tell you what, it, being in those churches, I've never gone down to an altar before, go to you know, participate in an altar call, never one time. I've seen them, I've witnessed them, and you know what? It's always made me feel very uncomfortable every single time I've been in there. I couldn't imagine just getting up and getting out and coming down in front of everybody, especially if I'm unsaved. Now, think about this. Think about an example where you might be going to church for a long time, and this, is, this happens more often than you probably realize. People could go to church for a very long time and be unsaved. Not because they're rejecting of the word, but because they didn't understand the gospel. 
They think they're doing everything right. They think they're going to heaven ultimately because they're a good person. Yeah, they've heard by grace through faith, but maybe it's never really sunk in. And they're going to church. They're going to church for a long time. Everyone looks at them. Oh, brother so-and-so, they're saved. You know, they don't think anything of it. One day they finally realize, I'm not saved. Right? But they've been going to this church to where week after week, when people get saved, it's a result of them coming up, getting in the aisle, bowing down and talking to someone at the front or whatever they do, you know, to get saved. And that's like part of the process that, you, well, in order to get saved, I need to come down the aisle during the altar call in order to get saved. Don't you think it might be a little embarrassing for someone who's been going to church for a really long time to all of a sudden when, when the pastor's saying, hey, if you don't know for sure that you're saved, you know, come on down to get up in front of everybody now and, and admit, yeah, I haven't been saved this whole time. Now, should they be? No. I mean, they, they should be able to get saved, but you're, you're kind of putting an extra yoke on people to, to say, that, and, and you know what happens also? It's not just that. It would be one thing if that was just one small aspect, but Typically, what, what happens is that when there's a visitor, the obligation of, of everybody in the church, of every believer, to, to be able to confront somebody and ask them about salvation and try to preach the gospel on them is completely absolved because they say, oh, well, the pastor did an altar call and they didn't come forward, so they must either be saved or they don't want to hear about it. And it's kind of like use that as an excuse not to approach people, not to approach a visitor, and not to just ask them, look, we're a church that when you come in and visit for, some, for the first time, hopefully somebody is going to ask you if you're saved. Because just because you come to church doesn't make you saved. And I wouldn't ever be, I never get offended when I go and visit another church and someone comes up to me and asks me about my testimony, asks me about my salvation. I love that. I say praise the Lord for that because I wish more churches were doing that instead of being just assuming that people are saved. There's so many people come to church that are unsaved and they come to visit. What better opportunity is there than when they come into the church and you know, ask them for it? But you, you know, when you have this other routine set up of just saying, oh, well, they did an altar call, so I'm good. I don't need to worry about that. It's a shame because then people just think it's, it's been taken care of and, and, and takes the, the emphasis off of yourself to do something like that. And I think it just makes, it makes salvation that much more difficult to have to go through the steps of coming up in front of everybody to get saved. I'm not saying the people that do that think that they're working somehow by, by approaching an altar, but it, it is making it more difficult. The other aspect here is that the altar calls are mostly emotional. It's one of those things where they, they've got the music playing and it's usually, you know, one of these songs is trying to, trying to get you to come. Like, won't you come? Won't you come? And, and, you know, and the preacher's telling you and, and getting you all worked up to make an emotional decision. Now, emotional decisions, I believe, are never a good idea. If you're going to make a decision that's just based strictly on emotion, not good. We need to make sure that we have clarity, that we have a, um, a firm understanding and that we're being rational about the decisions that we make. We need to make sure that, that it's founded in the truth and it's coming from God's word. Now, being persuasive you know, and, and telling people the truth, it may hurt, it may, it may, it may, um, it may cause some emotion in you. And there's nothing wrong with that. But just strictly getting people to get real emotional and then make a decision on that, not a good idea. Because those types of decisions are more spur of the moment and it's not going to stick. If you want to do something, if you want to change something, then you need to be really clear about what you're doing and what you're getting into. I don't like the concept of compelling people to make vows because that's what they're doing oftentimes. Not, not just the altar call for salvation, but the altar calls where they say, hey, you know, and they, they preach a certain subject on some sin, on, you know, on, on soul, on whatever the case may be. And they want you to come up and make a vow, and make a promise unto God and dedicate your life unto God and do all these different things at the altar. And 
Look, I want people to change their life as much as anyone else. I want people to get right with God. I do. And I try to preach that way. And I, and I want you, to, you know, the God's word to sink in. And I want you to make a change and make a commitment and whatever that might be in your heart. But I don't want to, like, compel you to do something in a way there where you're going to come and make some promise unto God that you're not going to keep. And the reason being is that God expects you to pay your vows. Okay, when we, when we make a vow unto God, when we promise God something, we say, God, I'm going to do this, He takes that very seriously. He takes you at your word. You think about how much God can be trusted to keep His word and how, much impo how important it is that God's word is kept pure and true and God cannot go back on any of His words. He cannot you know, break a promise. Everything that God says comes to pass. And, and he expects everyone to, be, you know, to believe that. How else could we believe it if he, was ever, if he ever failed, if he ever did anything wrong, right? So God treats his word very highly. He, he, he exalts his word. But in like manner, he says, okay, when you then make promises, when you say things, I expect you to keep them. Turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. In the Old Testament, you got the book of Psalms and then Proverbs and then Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. I'm just gonna, we're going to go over a few verses here of just on the importance of keeping vows. I don't want to get you in an emotional state. I don't want to try to work you up to come, to come and make some promise unto God if the only reason you're making it is just because you kind of got real emotional and you kind of got worked up, but then tomorrow you're going to forget about what, everything that happened anyways and just go and break whatever promise you made unto God. I want, you to make, I want you to make the changes. I want you to do what's right. And if you're going to make a vow, I'd rather have you be really serious about it and understand fully what you're doing instead of just getting emotional about it and just being caught up in the moment. Yeah. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, look at verse number 4. The Bible reads, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. And it's way better for you just not to vow at all. Don't make a promise unto God than if you do make a promise and then not pay and not, and not perform it, not do it, not carry it out. Don't think that God's going to be all impressed with some great vow. Oh God, I promised you I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that because it sounds great when you're saying it, right? He's saying, don't do that unless you're actually going to do it and see it through. People get too caught up in this, in this idea of these, these great visions and then just never following through with them. God says that you're a fool if you do that. And it says in verse 6, suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. He said, don't let your mouth cause you to sin. Because when you make these vows and don't follow through with them, it is a sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Oh, it was a mistake. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. We need to keep that healthy fear of God and understand when we speak to him and we make a promise, he's going to hold us to that word. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And, and ultimately, the, the main theme you're going to find in the Bible when it comes to making vows and making these promises and, and, and telling God and stuff is just don't do it. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what you're going to find is just don't do it because God doesn't require it of you at all. If you go through your life and you never make a vow, you've never, you haven't sinned at all because God has not required you to make some vow to Him and make some promise to Him. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, we're going to see Jesus teaching here. Matthew 5, 33, the Bible reads, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said of, by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Right? We just read that, that we should perform our oaths. Verse 34, But I say unto you, swear not at all, 
Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. He's saying don't even swear at all. And in James 5, 12, you don't have to turn there, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay, nay, lest you fall into condemnation. He's saying when you say something, it's either yes or no. I'm going to do something, yes, no. But don't go and start making an oath or a swear because what are you doing? You're trying to prove to someone, no, really, I'm going to do this. Right? You're trying to add emphasis to your words. Hey, why don't you just say either yes or no and just stick to that anyways? Why don't you just have integrity in the things that you say and be truthful and be honest and stick to whatever it is that comes out of your mouth? Don't go adding extra promises, extra vows, extra oaths under the things that you say. That's when you get yourself into trouble. And at many of these altar calls that I've witnessed, they're, they're compelling people to come up and make promises unto God. And I don't think that's a wise thing to do. You also end up with these altar calls with people that do things just to be seen of men and to appear righteous before other people. I mean, you know what? There's these churches that are filled with someone that every single time there's an altar call, they're always coming forward. They're always coming down. They're there every single time. And there's also a stigma that can be put on people then that don't go down it's like, oh, yeah, he's rebellious. Oh, they're proud. Oh, they're too good. You know, like, they've got a heart problem because they're not coming down to the altar to participate in worshiping a man or even look like you're doing that. <coughs> I've been to services where the sermon preached literally should apply to everyone. I mean, like, whatever the topic was, it was just something that, of course, this applies to everybody, right? Everybody should be convicted by certain sermons, where, you know, they're common sins. There's common problems that, that we all have and we struggle with. And then it's like, they're saying, well, you know, if your heart was touched, then come down here and get right with God right now. So then you're stuck in this position like, well, I don't really do the altar call thing. But then what are you saying? I don't struggle. I don't have a problem with this. I'm perfect. I'm sinless. You know, and it's one of these goofy things that, that puts you in these, in these weird situations when, it's like, I don't do that. I think I've gone to a church once with like Pastor Anderson, and I think we were like the only two that didn't go down to, to, to the altar during the altar call. It's like we were just standing there. It's like, and how do you know that? Because nobody ever closes their eyes and bows their head for the entire time you're standing there. <laughs> you're always looking. And how are you supposed to be able to close your eyes when you walk up there anyways, right? Everyone's eyes are supposed to be closed and heads bowed, but somehow you need to, to make your way up to the front. But... Um, you know, it, basically, it just turns into a big show. I want people's lives to change. It's not that at all, but, but we need to be wise about it. You need to be wise about the vows, and we need to make sure we don't just turn church into a circus. We don't just turn it into a big show of who's the spiritual ones and who's not, and, you know, Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so are always coming down the altar. Look how pious they are. Look how holy they are. They're always you know, coming before God. They're real humble. Look, God knows your heart. We don't need to make a show in front of men. We don't need an altar. It's not even an altar. You don't need to come. Look, there's nothing special about the front of the building here. We're renting out an office space right now. This is not some holy area. I can mark it off with some tape and say, you know, hey, take the shoes off your feet because now you're standing on holy ground. That's not the way it is in our New Testament churches. We don't have that anywhere. We don't need to come before something to, to feel closer to God. Amen. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. There's no altar in the New Testament. And you know what? When you do make decisions to, to change something in your life, the way that that should be shown unto others is not by coming before some altar, but by your actions. Just let your actions speak for yourself. The decisions that you make should be evident by your actions. Hebrews chapter 10. He 
Hebrews is a great book. Hebrews is a lot of explaining. If you want to know all the differences and, and, you know, and the changes that have been made between the Old Testament and New Testament, go to the book of Hebrews. It was written specifically for the people who, are, who were the children of Israel, who were the Hebrews that had gotten saved, to help them understand the differences. Okay, here's what's changed. Here's what hasn't changed. Here's what we're doing now. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. So he's explaining the sacrifices of the Old Testament right here, saying they've never been able to make people perfect. You know, some people think that people got saved in the Old Testament by offering up their sacrifices. Right. Never. That has never saved a person, not even one time. Now, was it part of the law? Absolutely. Was it something they were supposed to do year after year? Yes. But did that take away their sins? No. It was a picture, it was a figure of the, of the Christ that was to come to take away their sins with His precious blood. Not the blood of the bulls and of goats. They could never take away sins. Look at verse number 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. Saying if, if the sacrifice that they made was able to actually you know, cleanse you of your sins, then why do they need to keep offering them? They should have been able to just been offered once and just purged you of, of your sins and be done with. He said, but that's not the case. But in those sacrifices, verse 3, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. This is something that they did annually. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. What's he saying there? He didn't, what, you know, wouldest means didn't want. Sacrifice and offering, offering up sacrifices, giving offerings, that's not what he wanted. But he provided a body. Look at verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book is written of me, to do thy will, O God. It wasn't in God's will to just have these burnt, burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. It was really for Jesus Christ to come and be the, 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 the offering for sin. Verse 8. The above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He explains exactly what it was all about. It wasn't ever about the sacrifices. It wasn't about the offerings. That's not what got them saved. That's not what paid for their sins. And, but that is what they offered up on the altar. There's no altar in the New Testament. The altar has been done away. When Jesus Christ came and paid for our sins once for all, no more need for an altar. Amen. No more need for those sacrifices being brought up, for those offerings being brought up. The altar's gone. The altar's done. Jesus Christ has fulfilled that. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm just going to show you real quickly. We're almost done. Why we don't need an altar to make a sacrifice unto God. We don't need to call anything an altar. We can make sacrifices to God. Look, and I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not preaching not to make sacrifices to God. There are good sacrifices in our life, but you know what the sacrifice isn't going to be? It's not going to be a bull. It's not going to be a goat. It's not going to be some burnt offering. That would actually be blasphemous to bring an offering like that unto the Lord once Jesus Christ has paid for everything once for all. Right. We don't do that. We, we, we never would want to do that. But there's offerings that we can make, and, and which is legitimate in the New Testament, that you don't need an altar for. We don't need the altar calls. We don't need an altar set up in the New Testament to make sacrifices. Let's make the sacrifices, the legitimate ones, but we have no need of an altar. Look at verse number 9 of Hebrews 13. 
Verse number 9 reads, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. Right? Don't worry about these, these weird doctrines that people are teaching, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here, we, here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Notice here, it says, We have an altar where they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Saying, it's not the, ta the, the altar of the tabernacle. It's not the altar where you, they would offer up the meat and, the, and, and the, the sacrifices, the blood that was brought into the sanctuary. He says, But Jesus, who suffered outside of the gate, who is outside of Jerusalem, let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Let's just walk in his steps. He says, for here we have no continuing city. We're not looking for, for the, the physical Jerusalem and the altar and the temple that was built for all this. That's all been done away with. We're looking for the spiritual Jerusalem. He says, let's offer the sacrifice of praise. That's the sacrifice we're We're not worried about the animal sacrifices. Let's offer a sacrifice of praise. Let's sing praise unto God. Let's give God thanks. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. So that's a sacrifice. That's something that, that you can do, but we don't need an altar for that. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Is the, last, the last place I'll have you look. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We could offer the sacrifice of praise, and we could offer up the sacrifice of our own bodies. Our own bodies as a living sacrifice, as it says in Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Offer yourself up. Sacrifice yourself to God. You don't need an altar for that. You don't need to come to a so-called altar for that that meets none of the descriptions that the Bible gives for an altar. You, don't, you, know, you can do that between God and you yourself. You know, the, the veil has been rent in twain when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. The veil has been split. We, you know, we don't need some mediator to come between us and God. We can go to God directly. We could come boldly unto the throne of Christ. We could say, here I am, God. I'm going to offer up myself as a sacrifice to you. You can do that in church. You could do that in your home. You could do that anywhere. You could offer up yourself as a living sacrifice, but you don't need some special altar in the New Testament to do that. And we don't need to be making a circus or a big show out of the way that we serve God. The things that we do when we gather together, let's try to stick to what the Bible says. We don't need to make a big show. I mean, Jesus spent a lot of time in, in Matthew chapter 7 about people you know, that, that love the, 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 the Pharisees that love to wear the long clothing and, and make the long prayers and get the praise of men. And you know what the altar call is when people are coming down and getting right with God? It's, it's, you're being seen of men. God's going to respect you a lot more when you get right with Him, but you're not making a spectacle out of it. Because it's not about you. And you don't need to... Look, if, if, if there was something in Scripture that said, well, in order to get right with God, you need to come and do this and bow down before something and, and do that, then I would say, fine, let's do it. Right. But it's not found anywhere in Scripture. Amen. So I'm going to urge you, when you have a decision to make in your life, to get in your closet at home, get on your knees before God, where nobody can see you, and get right with God. And don't just make some, some spur-of-the-moment emotional decision to make a promise unto God that you're not going to keep, but think about the things that you hear and decide that I am going to make this change, and I am going to do it, and you can tell God about it. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you give us in the Bible, Lord. Um, 
There's a lot of things that, that are being taught in various churches, dear Lord, and, and a lot of people believe different ways. But I pray that you please help us in our service to you here at Word of Truth Baptist Church, dear Lord, that we wouldn't just cling to any tradition, no matter where it's been learned from, if it's not found in Scripture, if it's, if it's contradictory, especially to your word, dear Lord. Help us to just be able to serve you in truth and in honesty, dear God, and in, um, in the way that you would have us to do so, and help us not to allow... Um, you know, vain tra traditions of men to kind of infiltrate and get in and, and corrupt our service to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.